The Russo-Japanese War legitimized the Japanese Empire with world power status while providing an accelerant for the declining Imperial Russia to head towards revolution and ultimately towards its collapse. So let's get into it. We'll start with the origins of the war. The story of how Japan ended up at war with Russia begins in the 1600s. At that time, Japanese shogun leaders became convinced that foreign influence, and in particular Christian missionaries, were corrupting Japanese society. They were determined to cleanse themselves of all foreign influence and isolate themselves from the world. For 200 years, Japan maintained a strict isolation from the outside world. Then Admiral Perry of the U.S. Navy came along. In 1853, U.S. President Millard Fillmore approved a naval expedition to open Japan to trade. Perry showed up with gunboats in Tokyo Bay, demanding Japan trade with the U.S. The Japanese leading shogun realized that they were powerless to stop the U.S. ships from bombarding Tokyo at will, so they embraced a whole new worldview, opening themselves up to not only the U.S., but all Western powers. They embraced modernization as quickly as possible. Whether it was education, industry, technology, or military, Japanese society went through a complete overhaul. Perry had exposed their vulnerability against modern powers, and that fear of being at the mercy of a technologically advanced nation drove them to copy, improve, and innovate, as their motto would say. Part of modernizing meant territorial expansion. Island nations like Japan or England have the acute problem of when they build industrialized cities, that means more people are in a dense area, while simultaneously needing more farmland to support that urban growth. Japan's soil is tough to do extensive agriculture, but a solution can be found in Korea. If Japan takes Korea, they can greatly increase their agricultural access to feed their growing urban population. As well, Korea is strategically critical to Japan's survival being so close. So in 1894, Japan went to war with China and absolutely dominated them. The peace gave Japan dominance in Korea, all the way north to the Liaotung Peninsula, as well as Japan gained Formosa, or Taiwan, and forced China to pay a massive war indemnity, or penalty payment. There was a new dominant power in Asia that didn't sit well with the established Western powers, since they all had investment in China and did not want to see a stable power take hold there. So Russia intervened along with France and Germany assisting. Basically, those three powers told Japan they needed to release their claims on Korea or war would follow. Japan was too small and alone could not take on three three European powers, so they had to agree, but it left a deep burning resentment to retake the Korean and Manchurian regions they lost. That resentment was further amplified when China immediately agreed to lease the Liaotung Peninsula to Russia. In preparation for war with Russia, Japan first became allies with Great Britain. Now they could be confident that the other powers would not come to Russia's aid in war, since France was also trying to be friends with Great Britain, and Germany wasn't going to risk a war with Great Britain over Manchuria. The fight would now be one-on-one -on -one between Russia and Japan, exactly the way the Japanese wanted it. So why did Russia get involved in this conflict? Well, for starters, ever since Alexander I defeated Napoleon in 1815, the Russian Empire went through a very slow and painful decline, ultimately leading to their embarrassing defeat in the Crimean War in 1853. By the time of the 1900s, Russia was teetering on revolution and led by Nicholas II, who led a sheltered playboy lifestyle until being thrust on the throne. Nicholas liked the idea of continuing Russian expansion, like the glory days of Peter the Great. They couldn't expand in Europe since Germany and Austria-Hungary blocked them, Africa was all claimed up, and in the Middle East they would bump up against British interests in keeping everybody away from India. Asia was really the only option if they wanted to expand. China did have rich resources and markets, and once the Trans-Siberian Railroad was completed, they'd have a transportation network connecting Russia to the Far East. As well, the Manchurian region would provide Russia with the one thing they always coveted a warm water port. Before leasing Port Arthur, all Russian ports would freeze in the winter, making trade or flexible naval operations impossible. Only the Black Sea ports in Crimea did not freeze over, but they could be easily bottled shut. If Russia was going to reassert itself as a global power, Asia was the place to do it. Let's take a quick look at the two fighting forces and their strengths and weaknesses. Going into the conflict, most independent observers considered Russia to be able to easily handle Japan in a war. For starters, Russia had a total population of 130 million people to draw from, with a peacetime army of over a million with two million more in reserve. Japan's population was a mere 46 million with a peacetime army of 270,000 with only another 200,000 in reserve. As for the navies, Russia did have 21 total battleships but most were in European waters. In the Far East, the forces were much more equal. Russia's Far East Navy had seven battleships, seven cruisers, 25 destroyers, and 27 other smaller vessels, while Japan had six battleships, 10 cruisers, 40 destroyers, and 40 other smaller vessels. However, Japan's navy was all British built, so it was better quality and speed than Russia's. However, Japan could not count on replacements. Its shipyards had no facilities to repair capital ships, only capable of limited repairs. Russia, for its part, could draw from the home fleet with another five powerful battleships although they also did not have the ability to make substantial repairs in the Far East. As well, just like its navy, the Russian army had most of its troops in Europe, 
thousands of miles away. In fact, Russia only had roughly 80,000 troops in the region at the start of the conflict. This gave Japan a decided advantage in the initial stages of the war. The Japanese strategy was to strike hard and fast early, taking as much key strategic ground as possible in the initial fighting before Russia could throw in the massive weight of their manpower reserves. The two keys to the war would be could Russia get enough troops across the Trans-Siberian Railroad and into the fight, and could Japan's navy strike a decisive blow against the Russian navy to preserve the link between the Japanese islands and their forces on the Asian mainland. Let's get into the fighting. The war began with simultaneous surprise land and sea attacks. At sea, Togo's fleet of 6 battleships, 10 cruisers, 30 destroyers, and 40 torpedo boats would strike the Russian Pacific Fleet at Port Arthur. While their army landed a force at modern-day Incheon Harbor and would drive north up the Korean Peninsula. Their goal was to threaten Port Arthur from the rear and advance north into Manchuria to preempt the arrival of the Russian land forces via the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Togo sent 10 fast destroyers out ahead of his main fleet to launch a surprise attack on the night of February 8th. The Russian Navy was caught completely off guard since no formal declaration of war was given before the attack. The Russian fleet defenses in Port Arthur were abysmal, with no torpedo nets and all seven capital ships had anchored outside of the port on the night of the attack. In the night attack, the Japanese were able to damage two Russian battleships, but both were in shallow water and could be repaired. However, the psychological effect was devastating, as Russian crews made little effort in the aftermath to venture out and confront Togo's naval force. Port Arthur was essentially sealed off. Russia sent the only admiral it could count on, which isn't saying much since their navy sucked, and Vice Admiral Makarov. He did greatly to improve morale and stepped up defensive arrangements at Port Arthur. However, after only a month on the job, after chasing away Japanese ships from the harbor, his flagship battleship struck a mine and was destroyed, killing him and most of his crew. With his loss, all Russian naval initiative evaporated. Togo then sent naval forces up to Vladivostok to mine the harbor and make sure that the two Russian Far East fleets did not link up. On land, the Japanese forces advanced steadily north toward the Yalu River. From there, they would move into southern Manchuria. Russia, for its part, did not have substantial enough forces in the region to confront the Japanese, so the commanding Russian general, Kuryopatkin, was determined to fight a war of attrition, setting up his defensive line at Laoyao Yang, on the crucial railway line just south of Mukden. There, he would wait for reinforcements from the Trans-Siberian Railroad and then launch his counteroffensive. Japan was determined not to give him the time he needed. By mid-April 1904, the Japanese forces had reached the Yalu, using the same invasion route they had in the Sino-Japanese War. At the Yalu, the Russian commander ignored their plan for a phased withdrawal and attempted to battle the Japanese then and there. The Japanese heavy artillery was devastating, and they were able to destroy the Russian Eastern Detachment and cross the Yalu. The back door to Port Arthur was open. The next phase for the Japanese army was landing 90,000 more troops at the base of the Laotung Peninsula. Part of these troops would swing left to take Port Arthur, while the rest of the Japanese forces would combine and head north to deny Kuryopatkin the ability to come down and relieve Port Arthur. At sea, Japan took a hit. Well, two hits actually, when two of their battleships hit mines and sank, as well a cruiser sank after fog caused a collision, reducing Japan's capital ship force by a third. Russia technically had capital ship superiority of six to four in the Pacific, but they didn't know it. Japan kept the ship sinkings a secret, Thus, Russian naval leaders in the Pacific elected caution and decided to wait for naval reinforcements from the Baltic. Japanese land forces kept up their advances and in May, in the Battle of Nanshan, cut off Port Arthur from Manchuria. Japanese land forces were steadily moving north towards the key city of Mukden. With Port Arthur looking doomed, Tsar Nicholas ordered the commander of the Russian ships at Port Arthur to make a break for it and link up with the Vladivostok fleet. Because these ships were not allowed to recall at neutral ports, they heavily stocked up and headed out. Togo's Japanese fleet saw the thick black smoke in the air and went in to block them. In the resulting big gunship duel, the Russian flagship received mortal damage and chaos took over. Instead of operating as a fighting unit, the ships scattered and shattered as a fighting force. Five battleships and three destroyers managed to make it back to Port Arthur, while the other vessels ended up interned at neutral ports. After that seven-hour big gunship duel, the Russian fleet at Port Arthur would resign itself to its fate, not attempting to leave port again, either to be scuttled or destroyed by Japanese land batteries. If they had been able to link up with the Vladivostok fleet, they would have had a decisive advantage in firepower over the Japanese navy. On land, the Japanese forces moved in for the kill on Port Arthur, taking large casualties along the way. The Japanese strategy of full frontal assaults contributed heavily to this, but they kept clawing forward as fall started and the rains turned the battlefield into a muddy bog. One strong point after another had to be taken. By October of 1904, the Russian Tsar had finally decided to send the Baltic fleet to relieve Port Arthur. 
This fleet would need to make an 18,000 mile journey to the battle zone. But the Russian fleet, even if it didn't make it to Port Arthur, could be a major threat. If that fleet could defeat Togos, then the Japanese armies in Korea and Manchuria would be cut off and die. Time was of the essence to take Port Arthur, and finally, on January 2nd, 1905, the port finally caved in, after Japanese forces took the hills around the port and blasted into submission. The siege cost Japan up to 100,000 casualties. With the fall of Port Arthur, Russian revolutionary grumblings grew louder, and ultimately led to the Bloody Sunday Massacre, where roughly a thousand demonstrators were killed by soldiers near the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. In Manchuria, Japanese armies totaling 128,000 continued to hammer Russia's 158,000 man army of Manchuria. Reinforcements had started to pour in, but the motivation and overall quality of these troops were questionable. Russian commanders, for their part, had no faith in their army's ability to execute an offensive, and stuck to defensive strategy. By February of 1905, both sides were squaring up for the key battle of Mukden. The Japanese utilized a pin and hook strategy where one force would attack head on, giving the impression of being the main assault, while another force looped to the west and cut off the railroad 10 miles north of Mukden, effectively eliminating the retreat route. With the troops released from the Port Arthur siege, the Japanese army was barely able to pull off the maneuver and cut off Mukden, forcing the Russian army to abandon it. Each side had lost about a third of their forces in the fighting. Japan may have won the key battles of Port Arthur and Mukden, but in them, they had exhausted all offensive ability. From here, they would have to try and hold off the inevitable masses of a Russian counterattack. However, events at sea preserved the results of the army. The relief force sent from the Baltic to aid Port Arthur was led by no fucking way I'm trying to say that. The flotilla was 50 ships strong, including four new battleships and three older ones. Since the laws of war did not permit coaling at neutral ports, the Russian ships were overloaded with coal for the 18,000 mile trip. The journey started bad when the fleet accidentally killed British fishermen at Dogger Bank, confusing them for Japanese torpedo boats. A big win for Japanese propaganda. The journey wasn't much better from there, as they had to go all the way around the tip of Africa since the British were not likely to let the huge armada through the Suez. Mutiny, disease, food spoiling, and the deteriorating condition of the ships plagued the whole journey. It was basically the journey from hell. All of that, and by the time they made it to Singapore, Port Arthur had already fallen. And now, they were tasked with linking up with the fleet at Vladivostok. Limited coal supplies made it so that the route east of Japan was impossible, so they had to go through the Straits of Tsushima, where Admiral Togo was waiting to pounce. The iconic battle pitted eight Russian battleships against Japan's five, but Japan's British-built battleships were of much higher quality, with higher explosive ability, better range-finding technology, and increased wireless communication ability. Combine that with Japanese ship crews being better trained and having more experience while being very close to home against an enemy exhausted from a journey around the world and you have a decisive advantage for the Japanese. The ensuing battle of Tashima on May 28th to 29th, 1905 was more of a massacre. Admiral Togo utilized Japanese battleships big 12 inch guns brilliantly and boldly by crossing the Russians T and devastating them with cannon fire. The total Russian losses were six battleships sunk and two more captured. And out of the other 30 vessels, 15 were sunk and nine others put out of action. The Russians lost 5,000 total killed, while Japan lost a whole three torpedo ships sunk and 117 dead. This was the last action of the war. Russia had been thoroughly defeated on land and sea, while Japan was at the end of its tether. Their army was down to its last reserves and the Navy was running low on ammunition and coal. And now we get to the peace, which is where Teddy Roosevelt comes in. After Tsushima, Teddy reached out to both Russia and Japan in backdoor channels to bring them to the negotiating table. Both Russia and Japan sent diplomats to the US for peace negotiations in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. In the background of these negotiations, Russia had four fresh divisions sent to Manchuria for a winter counteroffensive. During negotiations, Russia agreed Japan would retain Port Arthur on a lease, recognize Japanese predominance in Korea, withdrew their forces from Manchuria, and transfer the southern portions of the Manchurian feeder lines of the Trans-Siberian Railway to Japanese control. But they absolutely rejected Japanese demands for an indemnity, or for the surrender of the northernmost island in the Japanese island group of Sakhalin. Those two demands were considered paramount to Japan. Finally, in late August of 1905, Russia gave their final offer. Japan could have half the Sakhalin Island and no indemnity pay. Take it or leave it. The Japanese diplomats reluctantly accepted. The Russian diplomat Witty was considered to have negotiated brilliantly since they gave up little in the final settlement. Japanese public opinion was livid at the peace treaty. They saw a war in which they won every battle and didn't even get all the territory they were promised or the war pay they had earned. 
Japanese public opinion quickly turned against the United States, feeling that Teddy Roosevelt had favored Russia at the negotiations and had sold out Japanese interests. In the end, it would have been hard for the Japanese diplomats to get more out of the negotiations than they did. Japan was low on men, munitions, and money, while Russia had vast manpower reserves, who they could have thrown into the Manchurian counteroffensive. Sure, Japan owned the seas, but battleships could be of little to no value for the coming land offensive. In conclusion, the de facto loss in this war with Japan accelerated the end of Imperial Russia as revolts and mutiny were breaking out all across the country. While for Japan, it legitimized the Imperial Japanese Empire as a world power, while simultaneously putting them on a collision course with the other major Pacific power, the United States.